tonight for the purpose of knowing how that to operate the church of the living God which we believe to be a part of this church and I want to first thing I want to uh, say that in my travels around the world so far as I know this is one of uh, of the most spiritual places where you feel the Spirit of God more than any other place I know. I had two other places in mind that used to be. But so far, we, we don't uh, seem to see those places. One of them has went into the organization and the other has, uh, has kind of fallen. So uh, I was called uh, yesterday and was, was told me that you all wanted a meeting to ask me these questions concerning your duties in this church. And I, um, that's what I'm here for tonight, is in, uh, to, uh, to set the church or to give to you the things that I think that, that is what's substantial to make this church to continue on. Brethren, I'm sure that you do realize that is, I've made this remark about uh, this being a spiritual place. It isn't the biggest place in the world. And it isn't what we have the most singing, the most screaming, and the most hollering, or the most uh, speaking in tongues and things. That isn't it. But it's the quality of the Spirit that operates here in this tabernacle. And so far, I want to command and thank Brother Neville and, and you brethren here trustees and deacons and Sunday school superintendent and all for for what you have done and helping keeping this away. It's been a long prayer of mine and a desire since a boy to see the church put in order and kept in order. Now, when we dedicated the church, I told you a little later, I had something to talk to you about how to set this thing in order the way it should be run. And... Uh, you started off uh, after leaving here. We had ministers and so forth. But now, Brother Neville, being just young among us, come among us. I thought it'd be better for Brother Neville to get better established in the faith before I presented such things as I'm about to do now. But now, after I find out that he is uh, getting well established in the faith and understands what the doctrine is and, and has uh, played the part of a faithful witness to Christ and holding for what we believe to be the truth. I think it's the hour now would be a good time to approach him and among you elders and things here of the church that you would take these orders and remember them. They're the best of my knowledge before God. And then I'm looking to you to carry these things out the way that I'm saying them because somebody has to be ahead around here. You have to have... Now, I'm not trying to assert authority or something like that, but you see, a man or anything with two heads to it, it, it doesn't know how to go. God never did have two heads to his church. He never did. It's one head. He always dealt in every generation as we've studied through the Scriptures. There's always one individual that he deals with because you get two men, you got two opinions. It's got to come to one final absolute and my absolute is the Word, the Bible. And as a pastor here of the church, my absolute is the Word. And I, w I know you are brothers. You kind of look to me to be your absolute to what, as long as I follow God, as Paul said in the Scripture, you follow me as I follow Christ. And then I expect you, brethren, at any time that you see me, to get away from this scripture, to come to me privately and tell me where I'm wrong. I don't care if you're one of the trustees or if you're the janitor 
whoever you are. You're duty bound to me as a brother in Christ to tell me when I'm wrong, scripturally. If it's a question, let's sit down and solve it out together. And that's why you've come, I suppose, to me tonight, brought me in here, is because that there's questions here that seems to be questioning you in your mind. For the things that I have, have here, I remember, brethren, I don't know, there's no name signed on any of these tickets, but in their wrote, and I can't, don't know who wrote them, but there are questions that's on your mind. And I'm here to answer them to the best of my knowledge. And remember, God is looking to me to see that I stay in the Word. And I'm looking to you to see that you carry out the Word see, see, in this church. And keep it spiritual. For remember, all the forces of, of the dark kingdom of Satan will be turned against you as you begin to grow in the Lord. And you must be soldiers, not just fresh recruits. You're aged soldiers now. I've been trained to fight. And Satan will come among you, cause you to dispute with one another if you can. Turn him down. Just immediately, you're brethren. And it's the enemy. And we're here to hold a standard in this evening light time that when the world is darkened and the whole uh, church kingdom is going into the council of churches, and pretty soon... They'll try to tack a sign on this door, you're closed. And then we're going to have to meet other places because they'll certainly close these churches one of these days if we don't take the mark of the beast. And uh, we're depending on staying true to God till death sets us free. And that's what we intend to do. Now, straight to the... And I would ask that if ever a time that any of these things come into question, that this tape may be played before the members of this church see, at your meetings or prayer of the meeting, just before the meeting starts. Turn this tape on and play it. And may the congregation here understand that these men are duty-bound to God as their oath in this church to help hold these principles. You may disagree with them. And if I let you run it, then I disagree with you. We've got to have some source somewhere where there's got to be a, an ultimate. And as best that I know, I'm giving it under the Holy Spirit, letting Him be my ultimate, and let this tape be your ultimate on these questions. Now the first one is, how shall the church act towards calls for financial help uh, uh, for food and clothing? What, what act, what, what should the church do? Now, we realize that the church is responsible for its own, for our members here of the church. We are totally responsible as far as we have needs to supply them with. We are responsible for our own. That's steady, constant members of the tabernacle that come here and worship with us. We are duty-bound to them as our brothers and sisters who have proven to be our members of this gathering. Now, we realize that there is millions tonight without food, without clothing, and we would love to be able to help the whole group of them to do everything we could. But financially, we cannot do that. We can't support all the world. But we are duty-bound to our own. And I think in that and then if we have anything left over that you would want to contribute to people who are not members here of this church, something that you would want to give to them, it should be met between the, uh, the board of the deacons. The deacons is the one that, that has to meet this opposition, or this problem, rather, because that in the Bible... When the dispute come up about food and clothing and so forth in the book of Acts, they called the apostles in about it. They said, go look out for yourself, uh, seven men of honest report and full of the Holy Ghost, that they might attend to these things, because we will give ourselves continually to the Word of God and in prayer. 
And it isn't the pastor's duty to look out to the, uh, for the food and so forth. That's supposed to be by the deacons. It isn't the trustee. It is the deacon's office to do this. And then this should be, remember, in the Bible, they was contributing to their own. The Greeks and the, and the Jewish, where the argument come up that one was getting a little more than the other, but it was people who had sold all their goods and had given in to the church for its support. And then to, to be divided out among them equally, and there was a little dispute come up, and there's where we got our first deacons, and that's one of their duties is to do that. I think that as our own, as our own people, uh, we should take care of them, and it should be turned in any complaint to the chairman of the deacon board. And then it should be met by the deacon board and see what they're able to do about it. And all of those things, which is clothing and food and financial help or whatever it is, should come through the deacons. Then the deacons, when they decide that they are, that they are what they're going to do about it, then it should be presented then unto the, uh, the treasurer to see if the treasurer is able at this time to pay this certain amount of finance or, or buy these clothing or whatever it is to that. But the, the deacon board should meet on that. And it doesn't go to the trustees or to the pastor. It's a deacon's thing altogether. Now, then question number two. Is it su sufficient to say openly from the pulpit that tongues and interpretations should be done in a meeting before the service? That's the second question on this uh, slip of paper that I have here, which is a little card. Now, this would be uh, pertaining to the pastor here, see, because he, after all, over the spiritual part, he's the head of that. Deacons are policemen in the church to keep order and to take care of these things and feeding the poor and so forth. The trustees are over the finance and the building. That's what they are to look after. But the pastor is over the, the supervising of the spiritual part. And this would go to you, Brother Neville. Now, there, some time ago when the uh, order was set to the church, uh, I do believe in speaking in tongues and interpretation and all the fine spiritual gifts that's ordained of God to be in the church. But we are living in a day just like it was in the Bible time. Where the churches, now you notice Paul, he founded the church at Ephesus, the Ephesian church, which is a well-established church. Did you notice we believe that Paul, and did say so himself, that he spoke with many tongues. And we know that he had gifts of tongues, not ones that he had learned, but those who were spiritually given to him because how he speaks it in Corinthians there. And to save time, I'm not just turning in the Bible and reading it for you because it would make our, our stay here too long tonight as I don't have too much time. And now, but just so that you can openly see. Now, uh... Paul never one time had to speak to the Ephesian church or to the Roman church or any of those other churches about their spiritual gifts, about how to put them in order. But he did have to speak to the Corinthians continually about it because they made it an issue all the time. And Paul said when he come among them, if uh, they found out that one had a tongue and one had a psalm, and he thanked the Lord for all their fine gifts and things like that. And if you notice in the first chapter 2 of Corinthians, Paul was telling positionally what they were in Christ, how he, they were positionally in Christ. Then after he told them, then like a father, he began to let the whip down on them and say, I hear there's contentions among you, and I hear that you get drunk at the Lord's table. He didn't unchristianize them. And don't you, brethren, do that. Unchristianize them. But it's the way they're behaving themselves in the house of God. That's where it's at. Now, I would say this, that as Paul of old said, that when you come together, if one speaks, let another uh, interpret. There be no interpreter, then hold your peace. But if there be an interpreter, now I've watched the church here, and I've seen you grow up. 
I've seen many spiritual gifts operating among you. Frankly, one I had to come to Brother Neville about with a word from the Lord to correct him on something that he was doing. And if I, if the Lord, is, the Holy Ghost has made me an overseer of the flock, then it's my duty to tell you the truth. And I'm very grateful to Brother Neville. He heeded to the truth. I can only say it as he tells me. Now, on this, as I've noticed your church growing and noticed it, and in the church, here's the way we had it first, and this is the way we, we want it again. Now, if you don't watch when babies, the first thing a baby does is try to talk when he can't talk. See? He makes a lot of bubble and noise and, and so forth, but he thinks he's just, he can out-talk the preacher at that time. Well, we find that not only in the natural life, but we find that in the spiritual life also. It's a little one. And if you try to correct that baby and spank him a little bit because he's good and trying to talk, you'll ruin the child. See? And you'll hurt him. And it's best to let that baby grow a little while until he actually can speak his words right and then tell him when, not when Papa's talking or when Mama's talking, but when it's appropriate time let him have his say. Do you understand me? Now, let him talk when his time comes to talk. Now, if I've ever had anything that's been a thorn in my flesh out in the meeting, is someone to rise up when I'm speaking and then give a message in tongues and break the spirit. I've just come out of a meeting in New York and different places to where ministers let that go on time after time, and it's nothing but, but a confusion See, when God is dealing in one line of thought, he, it would be, it would, he would be defeating his own purpose if he's trying to get a line of thought to you, to the congregation to make an altar call and something buddy in. For instance, like this, we're sitting at the table talking, and uh, we're talking uh, about the Lord, and Junior runs into the table real quick, takes all the attention away from what we're doing, and hollers, scream out, Dad, Mom, my, my, I just hit a home run down to the team and we doing all this, that, and the other. And when we're right on a real, right down sacred subject. Now, him hitting a home run, that's all right. At the baseball game, that's all right. But he's out of order when he breaks in on the message that we're talking about. Let him wait till his time comes and then tell us what he did at the baseball game. Now, that's just the same thing we find with gifts today. That's the reason God cannot trust too many spiritual gifts with people. They don't know how to control them. That's what's the matter today. The reason we don't have no more than we do. And we do find there's a lot of impersonation of spiritual gifts. But I don't believe that's so here in our church. I'm thankful for that. I don't believe it's an impersonation at all. I believe we have genuine gifts, but we must know how to control those gifts. And then when you go to doing something good, just like you're working for a boss, and you start out on the first year job and you're willing to take orders, then the boss has confidence in you and will keep raising you up to a higher office all the time. Now, I believe that time has struck the Branham Tabernacle to know what to take the gifts that God gives us, that God can trust us with something even greater than what we have got. But we cannot... Uh, Go along and you see a man that's always have to be telling him and everything. And remember, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophet, says the scripture. When you see a man that you have to correct, or a woman, and that person gets out of order, and then you're telling him the scriptural truth, then it shows that the spirit that's on him isn't of God. Because the Bible said the spirit of the prophets are prophesying, that's testifying, preaching, speaking in tongues, or whatever it is, because tongues interpreted is prophecy. So it's subject to the prophet, and the word is the prophet. So we, we see that it's out of order for a man or a woman to jump up and give a message, no matter how much they want to do it, while the preacher is in the pulpit. Now, I suggest this for the Branham Tabernacle. That being that our, our gifts that we find, and we have some very fine gifted people here. Now, each one of those gifts are a ministry of their own. They are gifts just like preaching is a gift, like healing is a gift. 
like other things are gifts, these are gifts. They are ministries of their own. And each man is commanded to wait on his own ministry. Therefore, let the brand of tabernacle be operated like this. And in the day, especially this day, when we've had so much, uh, I don't want to say this, but so much make-believe. We don't want make-believe. No man, no honest person wants to have a make-believe. We, if we can't have the real, let's not have any at all. Let's wait till we do get the real. I believe you, you man would agree with that. We don't want nothing make-believe. Brethren, we can't start on make-believe something and leave in this world. We got to have what's real, what's genuine. If we haven't got it, let's wait till we do get it and then say something about it. See? Now, I would say, let all these men and women who speak in tongues and prophesy and give messages, and I, I'm believing with you men that they are genuine. Now, the Bible has said, prove all things and hold fast to that what's good. For with stammer lips and other tongues will I speak to this people. This is the rest that I said that they should enter into over in the book of Isaiah. Now, I would suggest this so that the sanctuary will only be ministered by one gift at a time. For it brings us straight back in order again of what I'm trying to say. If one speaking, let the spirit of the prophets be subject to the prophet. Do you understand? Now, let those who have a ministry to the body of Christ. And now it's being said, now let it be done. Let those who have a ministry to the body of Christ wait on their ministry because it is a ministry from Christ to the church. But you can't all minister at the same time. There's got to be one at a time. The Branham Tabernacle shall be like this. Let those who speak with tongues and those who interpret tongues and those have prophecy that's to be given to the church, let them come among themselves early in the, before the meeting starts. Let them gather in an appointed room and wait on the ministry of the Lord as the pastor has to do himself before he comes into the audience. He must take the Bible, study in the quietness of his room in the Spirit, and be anointed to come out before the audience to speak. If he doesn't, He's going to be confused when he gets out there. Let each man and each woman with a spiritual gift come before the Lord and being that the pastor has a single ministry, he is a prophet. The English word of preacher means a prophet. That's a fourth teller of the word. Let those who have ministries that has to be part of someone else like one to speak with tongues and another to interpret. They wait together on their ministry. They cannot stay in a private study and speak in tongues and then come tell the other what he said because he'd have both tongues and interpretation. See? Now, if he has that, very well. We want to receive it like that. And we want the church to benefit by these gifts that's in our church. God sent them to us and it's, we want our church to benefit by these spiritual gifts. So let the man who speaks with tongues and the one who interprets and the one who prophesies, let them come together before the, the church ever meets. Let them meet in a room to themselves waiting on the ministry of the Lord to the church. Is it understood? And then, like this, if Brother Neville Say, well, I let me pardon me. Let me say this. If Brother Collins speaks with tongues and Brother Hickerson gives the interpretation, then they have a ministry together for the church. Now, that isn't the ministry of Brother Neville. That's your ministry to the church. I'm giving this as example. Then you, brethren, should be just as interested in getting your ministry in the place in the house of God as the pastor 
is interested in getting his because it's just essential that you do it. But you can't do it in the privacy of your own room if you speak and you interpret. You've got to come together. Now, come together in the church, off in a room to yourself because you have a private ministry. It's not an openly ministry. It's one that's to help the church. It's something to help the church, but it isn't to be done in the main congregation only the way I'm going to tell you it is to be done. See, Then, whatever Brother Collins speaks, and Brother Hickerson gives the interpretation as example, then let Brother uh, somebody write this down, what it is. And then, if it's coming, now we all know that the Lord is coming. We're aware of that. And if Brother Neville got up each night and said, Behold, the Lord is coming. Behold, the Lord is coming. That would be all right. See? But he's saying that, the pastor, at the platform, for he's got the word for that. And if he be a pastor, prophet to the church, or pastor, rather, he's to study the word of the Lord and tell you what's written in the word of the Lord about the coming of the Lord. And you're warned by that. A ministry otherwise to the church which he wouldn't have any connection with is tongues, interpretation of tongues, which is prophecy, or a prophet speaking. That's something that's not written in the Word. What's written in the Word, he's to bring it. But what's not written in the Word is what you're to tell him. Like, for instance, uh, tell um, uh, Brother Wheeler, uh, Thus saith the Lord, tomorrow in his sandpit, not to go to it, because you'll be a truck turnover or something like that. And it's got to be done. And you've spoken and he's interpreted. And then lay that on the platform after your ministry's finished the other night, after the church, the hymn starts singing and so forth. If your ministry's finished then, let them come forth with what prophecy has been given. And I do not think that we have, or if you do, put this in there. When these people meet together, let them who have wisdom first come. Because, you see, if one speaks in tongues and gives an interpretation according to Scripture, that cannot be received unless it be uh, witnessed by two or three people, two or three more witnesses. See, has to witness to that, that they believe it to be the Word of the Lord. Because sometimes in these minor ministries, just like in any other ministry, you get spirits that's wrong. See, they'll fly in there. And we don't want that. No. We want these ministries ready to be exposed if they're to be exposed. Because anything of God can... Don't worry about exposing it. It'll, it'll stand the test if it's of God. It's like the pastor. If somebody challenges him on the Word, he don't have to back up about it. He knows just exactly what he's talking to. Come on up here. See? And same as these other ministries. got to be the same way. Now, if, if one speaks in tongues and gives a message... Now, some people speak in tongues when they're just... Edifying themselves, the Bible says. They just have a good time. They speak in tongues. They feel, and they do speak in tongues. They actually speak with tongues. And it's the Spirit doing it. But if it's sitting out there in the audience, uh, speaking in tongues, just edifying themselves, then it isn't any profitable thing for the church. The man's edifying himself or the woman or whoever's doing it. See, to speak in tongues as a gift of God to edification, as Paul says in the Scripture, <clears throat> That it's to edify the church. So it had to be some direct message from God to the church. Outside of what's wrote here in the Bible. See? It's something. If you could ask me, uh, Brother Branham, uh, uh, how must I be baptized? I can tell you right quick. You don't have to speak in tongues and tell me that. It's wrote right here in the Bible. What to do about that. See? I don't have to, you don't have to ask no questions on that and have somebody speak in tongues and tell you. See? That's already written. But if you say, Brother Branham... Uh, what must I do? I've got a decision here I've got to make whether I should uh, uh, take this church or go to another church or something like that or should I uh, do this? Now, that'd have to come from God. See, God has to tell us that. But that would have to come through another ministry because the Word don't say let Arm and Neville leave Branham Tabernacle and go to the Fort Wayne Gospel Tabernacle. See, it don't say that in the Word here. See, so that's what these gifts are for. Like a person come up here and say, you believe in divine healing. We preach that. We believe it. We believe in knowing the oil. But here's some man says he can't get through. What's the matter? Then it takes God through tongue, interpretation, through prophecy, or some way to go down in that man's life and pull out that thing that he's done. 
and tell him about it. That's a ministry that doesn't belong to the pastor. It belongs to these ministering gifts. But they're not to be done out there in the audience. See, now Paul never one time had to tell those, uh, tell those Ephesian church anything about that. They were in order. The Roman church, or none of those other churches, only the Corinthian church. And they never could get themselves... Now Paul believed in speaking in tongues. He had speaking in tongues in the Ephesian church the same as he did in the Corinthian church. See? But he could speak to the Ephesians greater things than what just speaking in tongues, interpreting in tongues. Now, then, if someone writes a message that's been given in tongues or given in prophecy and laid upon the platform, it must be read by the pastor before the service starts of thus saith the Lord from these people who spoke and interpreted. And if that comes to pass exactly the way the interpretation said, we raise our hands and give thanks to God for His Spirit among us. If it doesn't come to pass, then don't do it anymore to that evil spirit's out of you. God don't lie. He's always truth. Then you see, you're old enough now to act like man, not children. Goo, goo, goo. you got to have some meaning to something. Let the church now, as it's coming in order, come to this order. If one prophesy, if one come among you unlearned, and you speak in tongues, you'll be a barbarian to him. You don't know what you're talking about. See? And really, in this day where there's been so much confusion about it, it causes a stumbling block. But let one speak in tongues and another interpret and give the message and let it be read off right here at the platform of what's going to take place and then let it happen and see what happens. Tell them that tomorrow at a certain time or next week at a certain time it's going to be a certain thing. Then let the unbelievers sitting there listen to that and see it's foretold before it happens. Then they'll know what kind of spirit's among you. It'll be God's spirit. That's why Paul said, then if one can prophesy and reveal the secret things, won't the whole congregation fall down or the unbeliever and say, God is in the midst of you? See? Because it cannot be. But now, we don't want, when we was a child, Paul said, I acted like a child. He told the Corinthians there. I spoke like a child. He had a child <laughs> mind. But when I become an adult, I put childish things away. Now, I'm telling you all, see, now, a few years ago, you were children with these gifts, playing back and forth. But you've been to a long school now. It's time to be man. Not use these just to play with. These gifts are sacred. They're of God. And you don't play with them. Let's let God use them. That's what your ministry wants to be. And that's the way to put the Branham Tabernacle in the service. And, and if this is questioned any time, let this tape stand as a witness. Now, that's the way it's to be done in the Branham Tabernacle. If there would be a stranger come in, because you have them all the time because this being an interdenominational tabernacle, there's people come in that doesn't have this well training. They don't have it. They don't know better in their own pastors. They'll jump right up and break his message up and tear all their call up and speak in tongues and everything like that. You're a better trained man in that. See? Then after the service, if he gets unruly, then it's a deacon's place to go to them. Don't let your pastor have to do it. Unless it comes to a spot where there's no deacon here. But a deacon is supposed to see to that. See? Now, after the service, if the person just raises up and gives a message, the pastor, if he wants to stop just a minute, go ahead. Very well. See, That's up to the pastor. But then immediately, let the deacon, before that person gets out of the building, take them to one side and talk to them about it. And if they question it, bring them to this tape and say, this is what the bishop or the overseer of the church, which is bishop, the bishop, any overseer, see? That's what it's called in the Bible, the bishop see. So that's general overseer of the church. Let This is the orders and way our church does it. Now, we love for you to come give your message, but if you've got a message from the Lord, and uh, it's, let it be given, come up here and lay it on our platform, and our minister will read it to the congregation, a message to this congregation, but it must not be just repeating scriptures and things like that. It must be a direct message to the people of something that's fixing to take place or something they should do. Is it understood? All right. Now, is there any better way to keep order in the church than to uh, keep uh, reminding the people uh, with a, uh, a repeat from the deacons accordingly? No. 
The, I've just explained that. That's question number three. The deacons, your duty is to keep order in the church with kindness, friendliness, and then you are supposed to. If someone gets out of order in the church or comes in here like a drunk or somebody come in like they shot that minister out of the platform the other night up there. You heard about that, that drunk coming in with a double barrel shotgun and they screamed for his wife and, and uh, wanted to wife and went up towards the pastor and, and the pastor showed him his wife sitting there, but he's going to shoot her right in the church. And the pastor started to dealing with him and instead of, uh, instead of the, uh, uh, the man with the shotgun turned around and shot the pastor out of the pulpit and then shot his wife and then shot himself. Now, if there'd been a bunch of deacons there when that man entered that door with that shotgun that had their arms around him and shotgun out of his hand. See? See, that's, that's orderly deacons. And now, these things have gone the way they're doing now. You might can just expect anything. But remember, the deacons are God's policemen in the house of God. No matter what anybody else thinks. Sometimes a policeman won't have to go up and make a rest on somebody. Maybe one of his friends, but he's sworn to an office. He's got to do it anyhow. That's his duty to his city. See? That's the duty of a deacon to the church. And uh, if uh, someone jumps up and starts interrupting the pastor or something like that, and a pastor in his message, the deacon's supposed to walk up to them people, two or three of them, say, could we speak to you, brother? See? Bring him from the church out into the office, in here or some other office, and speak to him about it. Say you not to interrupt. You know, it's a it's a great fine by the law to interrupt a service anyhow. See? But some people, such as a delinquent person or something, come among, you know, and, and some religious fanatic and, and start carrying on. Then the deacons, and if, and if the deacons don't seem to be able to control it, then the trustee board or anyone else in the church can step up and give help to such a person, you know. That, and... Uh, and now let me ask a question again here. Is there any better way to keep order in the church than to re remind the people with a repeat from the deacons? Now, occasionally. Now, I think that the the pastor ever so often or play this tape. Let that stand for a witness. Deacons are policemen. And their word is law and order. See? And they have the authority from the church and even from the laws of the nation to make that house of God be the right place. And anyone to contrary a deacon like that is subject to two to ten years in federal prison. If you tell them to go and they don't do it or something like that, somebody with disorderly conduct... He just don't know what he's doing. To, uh, he's uh, subjecting himself or liable on himself to all kinds of fines, anything. And then if it comes to a spot that somebody and I like, and if somebody jumps up and gets disorderly, just maybe speak in tongues or something, I wouldn't go in on that. See, let them go because if they're a stranger. If they're our own people, then just let the next night, you deacons, just get this tape and say, now we're going to play the orders of the church before we start the service. I want everybody to understand it. And you pastors and you all can work together like that. Now, Brother Branham, what about the Sunday school? Uh, Brother Branham, about the Sunday school, all right, should it be before the preaching service? Yes, we've always had it that way. You have the Sunday school before the preaching service. And um, that gives a chance for the little fellows who attend Sunday school to dismiss their classes and if and if they want, the little fellows don't understand it, they have to sit all the way through the preaching service and then have Sunday school, the little fellows are wore out. Let the Sunday school be first. Have a set time. Just at one set time, that Sunday school goes to session. <coughs> Sunday school superintendent is supposed to see that. And this Sunday school goes to session at a certain time, set time. And it's dismissed at a certain time. All the Sunday school allows so much time for that man dismissed. Should the teacher for the adult class be someone other than the pastor? If it's so agreed. If the pastor wants to teach the Sunday school and then bring the message later, that's fine and dandy. If he wants to do the double service. But if he doesn't, then have your adult Sunday school teacher, see, for your adult class. And then if, uh, if the uh, pastor uh, has somebody else there in mind and the person wants to do it, 
give yourself 30 minutes or whatever you're going to allow your Sunday school for, 30 or 35, 40 minutes, whatever it is, and there should be a bell set here. And when that bell is tapped, that means, or either the church bell, when it taps on the outside, that's dismissing Sunday school. And when that bell rings, that means everything come to order. Right there. There'd be so much time then for a hymn or two, whatever you ought to sing, not too much time. You'll wear the people out by keeping them too long, see. And uh, just tap the bell, have a hymn, and uh, whatever you're going to do, and then send your classes to the place, and immediately when that time comes, say it's going to be at, at 10 o'clock or 10.30 or 10.15, whatever it is, tap that bell, and uh, every teacher dismisses her class. Come to the audience out here, and then and give the report, Sunday school report, and then dismiss the whole thing and let all that wants to stay for preaching service be next. <coughs> and it's an order. <coughs> Question? How you many have a split class, in other words? Oh, yes. You should have uh, a three-year-old can't understand what a 14-year-old would understand. I think I got that a little farther. How many classes should there be? You should put your classes and like a little bitty class that wants to have flannel grass. That's too much for a 14-year-old boy or girl. See, You should have a, someone to take a class for those little babies, some old mother or something who knows how to take care of them. Other classes, I think, uh, should be uh, uh, somebody who's more uh, able to present the Word. See, And uh, there should be classes to say now there'd be like a class of from the at least three classes. There should be a little bitty baby class. There should be from about five years old and all the others under that should be kept with the mother and taken in the nursery if necessary during the time of the preaching if they go carrying on. That's what the nursery's out there for. And I think that the, the classes should be ranged from like the little babies about five or six years old up to eight or nine, ten, something like that. And then from ten years old on to fifteen should be in a the teenage class and then the adult class over the 15 because they if they're old enough to that nowadays they can get a job and they're wanting to vote at that age almost so they they should be uh, uh, able to hear the word but come out in the main auditorium and have that uh who should be the teachers there you are that's up to you to vote your own teachers in and you ought to do that put them in there get somebody and meet with the church and say uh, who's a uh, who here feels led of the Lord? And then get a qualified teacher. And then let it be done. It's got to be strictly business, brother. If the teacher can't qualify to it, then change teachers. When the time comes, as under God, if I feel like an arm and Neville can't no more qualify to be pastor here, I'm going to mention it to the church. When I'd see one thing here think that you deacons couldn't qualify to be deacons, I'm going to mention it to the church. And I find out there's a certain deacon out here doing something he shouldn't do and he doesn't keep his post of duty and so forth like that, or a trustee or whatever it is. I can't vote it in or out. The church has to do that. But I'm certainly going to present it before the church. See? Because that's what it should do. That's what I'm supposed to be. As overseer, I'm supposed to look and see what's going on. We're going to heaven. Not out here somewhere to a rally or something, to have a lot of fun and run over one another and play baseball. We're here handling the most gracious thing there is on earth, the Word of God. It's to be carried on in godly order. Uh, who should be the teachers? That's up to you to select them. Uh, but I would take, for the babies, I'd take an old woman. Some it can do that. But for the teenagers, I'd take some teacher that's strict. And not just going out here and having wiener roast. That'd be all right. They want to go on a wiener roast. But just put all the things of that. Put it to the Word. That's somebody who's able to hold the Word. And it's going to be, this church stands not for... Uh, wiener roasters, all right, and, and little picnics that you want to go together in fellowship, that's fine. That, that's what you should do to entertain the children. But in this place in here, this is the Word of God. Wiener roast is when you get together, something <coughs> like that, but not in this house of God. And these, no, of course, we know we don't believe in this year foolishness of, of, of parties and everything like that around here. We, we, you know better than that. Who should be over the Sunday school to keep it in order. The Sunday school superintendent. That's what his business is. He's not supposed to have anything to do with the deacons, trustees, pastors, or nobody else. He's got an office of his own. Whoever your Sunday school teacher is, I know not. But that Sunday school teacher is supposed to see that every class is in its place and every teacher is present or substitute another teacher for that teacher if they're not there on that day. 
then just before the Sunday, while the uh, lessons are going on, the Sunday school superintendent is to go by and take up the offerings that they've had in there, their Sunday school collection, and the report of how many present, how many Bibles they had in this class, and so forth, and make a report of it, and then stand before the audience just before the preaching service when he's given the spot to do it when they have the Sunday school uh, report after the Sunday school is over, tell how many teachers, how many present, how many of the whole Sunday school total, the whole total of offerings, and so forth like that. Deacons, trustees, pastors are not supposed to do that. They have nothing to do into it. That is the Sunday school superintendent's job. And then, if he sees that the Sunday school needs certain things, then he is to present that to the uh, 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 to the trustee board. And the trustees has a meeting up on it first. And then the trustees, if they find that there is sufficient funds and so forth through the treasure, then this can be purchased if you want something other for literature or whatever it is, or some Bibles or something you want to buy a Bible for uh, the one, you know, it can uh, find the most words and quote the most scripture, some prize or something they're going to give away like that for something they want to buy it to the church, then let that be presented to the to the to the uh, the deacons and then let them find out if it's if it's if it's in the treasure. See? And that I think that takes care of them. Uh, five questions on that. Now, on the next one is Brother Branham, in respect to the order of the church, we have tried to go accordingly to the way we understand the orders given in the dedication of the new church, and by doing so, some have gotten mad and left the church, and others will not listen to anything we say, especially the children. We have talked to the parents about their children and they won't take care of them. Now, have we misunderstood or are we going about it in the wrong way? Thanks. Now, let me answer this as they come down. Um, in respect to the order of the church, we have tried to go accordingly to the way we understood as given in the dedication of the new church. Now, that's correct. You're doing right. Now, this is supposed to be deacons, I suppose, because it's right here. It's the deacon's job. All right? And by doing so, we have often, people have often gotten mad at us. They do it me too. They'll do it any man. See? A person that does that, there's something wrong with that person. They're not right with God. For the Spirit of Christ is subject to Christ's teaching, Christ's house, Christ's order. See? And any man that, or any woman or any person, children, that would get angry with a godly deacon, that would tell them to be, or any parent would get angry with a deacon. Really. We want everybody in this church that we can get. But if that would only cause trouble somewhere else, there's a thorn or a rabbit in the woodpile, as we used to say it. That person isn't right. If they leave, there's only one thing to do. Let them go and pray for them. And maybe some of the deacons go to the church or go to the house sometime and find out why they left and ask them what was wrong. Then, and that they see if he can reconcile them. If they can't, then take two or three witnesses with him that they might be understood. Then if it can't be understood, then it's told before the church that they are a member here of the church. Then they are. And then if they're not members of the church, of course, they're not members of this congregation, they should be made to, to be ruled. See, they, they've got to listen to our orders here because this is the orders of the church. This is things we don't want to do, things that I don't like to do. But it's things that must be doing. I'm exposing myself and telling them here, but this tape, it's me. They can hear me talking and know that it's me. Not you, man. You've asked me these questions. And I'm giving it to you the best that I know how from the Word of God. Now, if those people get angry, go out from me. What does the Scripture say about it, Brother Bram? They went out from us because they wasn't of us. That settles it. Left the church. That's what they did. All right. Others will not listen to anything we say, especially the children. The children are supposed to know discipline. They should get it at home. But even if it's mine, my kids get in here at any time, they get this already. I don't want you to draw one string, Sarah, Rebecca, Joseph, Billy, or whoever it might be. You tell me. I'll see to it. If they can't behave, then they'll stay away from church till they do learn to behave. This is not an arena. This is a house of God. 
This is not a place to play and skate and write notes and laugh and cut up. This is the house of God. It's to be carried out godly. You come here to worship, not even to visit. This is not a this is not a picnic ground. This is not a visitation place. This is the visitation place of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what He has to say. Not to one another. We don't come here to fellowship uh, with one another. We come here to fellowship with Christ. This is a house of worship. And children must be disciplined. And if they are of the parents, let it be known that if these deacons, if these parents of the children will not listen to what these deacons said, then this parents should be corrected themselves. We have talked to the parents about the children and they won't take care of them. If they are members of this church, then you should take two or three with you and call that parent into a private meeting into one of the offices. I don't care who it is. If it's me, if it's Brother Neville, if it's Billy Paul and his little boy, if it's Brother Collins and one of his children or any of the rest of you, we are we love one another, but we're duty-bound to God and this Word. If it's Doc, no matter who it is, we're to call one another in and be honest with one another. How can God ever deal with us if we're not honest with one another? How are we going to be honest with Him? See? This is an order. We must keep the house of God. And deacons are supposed to know how to do that. See? And that's why I'm telling you now, I keep them things, call them, and if this, you tell the parents and they won't listen to the won't listen to it, then you get you another deacon or one of the trustees or some good person of this church and call, take your trust, take your deacon board, all your deacons together. Say, Brother Jones, Brother Henderson, Brother Jackson, whoever it might be, <laughs> see, their children are disbehaving. We've told them two or three times about these children and they won't listen to it. Then call Brother Jones in or Brother whoever it is and say, Brother Jones, we've called you in here for a meeting. We love you. And we, you're part of us. You're one of us. Let me just sit in this certain tape and listen to what Brother Branham said about it. See? Now, we've asked you to make those children behave, see? If they won't behave and you can't make them behave in church, leave them with someone while you come to church until they learn how to behave themselves in the house of God. See? But this is an order. It's got to be carried out, see? Now, the other question goes on. Now, have we misunderstood? No, sir, you haven't misunderstood. That's correct. I'm saying it again. The orders... In the army, they don't ask you, will you go do a certain thing? If you're in the army, you're compelled to do it. See? And that's the way it is. In the, I'm compelled to preach the gospel. I'm compelled to stand for this. Regardless of what my other man and brethren and so forth say about it, I'm compelled to do this. I have to hurt feelings and cut man to pieces. But if I, you don't want to get like uh, Oswald, see? If you can't disagree with a man and things, then shake his hand and still have the same feelings towards him then there's something wrong with you. If I can't disagree with a man bitterly from one side to the other and still think as much of him as, as Christ would, then there's something wrong with my spirit. I haven't the spirit of Christ. See? If he says, well, Brother Branham, I believe that you are teaching is this uh, all right, brother? Let's come together to reason, you and I. We'll take it ourselves. We'll go over here in the room to ourselves. We'll reason it out. And he just cuts me to pieces. And I have to say things back to him. If in my heart I can't feel the same about him and he's still my brother and I'm trying to help him, then I'll never help him. There's no way for me to help him. If I don't love him, what's use of going over there? Tell him in the first place, first brother, I don't love you and let me get that out of my heart right here before we go in there because I can't help you until I love you. And that's right. And that's the way, see, carry it on. You've done it exactly right. That's the way it should be. You never misunderstood it. Are we going about the wrong way? No, it is the right way to carry that. Let order be kept because it's constantly. Uh, little children, mothers, little babies and things, they, they'll cry. And if they get crying too much and interrupting your pastor up there, remember, you are his bodyguards. You're his gospel bodyguards. See? And if it's interrupting the message of the Lord, then you are deacons. What are you to do just like man speaking in tongues? He's duty-bound. And a man preaching, he's duty-bound to the Word. He's duty-bound to these things. Each one of you is duty-bound to an office. And that's, and that's just what we're, uh, we're here to do. Now, we don't want to wait too long, and I know I've got an appointment in a few minutes, so I'll, I'll just try to hurry as quick as I can. Brother Branham, there's three, two questions on this card here. Brother Branham, what should be the policy of taking up offerings in the church for people? 
how should this be done? I think taking up offerings in the church for people should not be done unless it's for your pastor. And I think if someone comes in for charity or something like that, that or someone in, in bad need, like one of our members here, a congregation, say if one of our brothers, and uh, they have some trouble, well, I think then that should be announced at the platform and let the pastor do that. I think it's his duty to do that. Some brother that's in need of something, let him present it to the church if it wants to be taken that way. If it's someone in need and, uh, and then uh, you don't want to take the offering up for the person that's in need, then let the boards meet together and agree upon certain sums that they want to give to this person out of the treasury. But the treasury is low at that time and they can't afford to do it. Then it has to be taken up. Well, let, let, the, let it be talked with the board, given orders to the pastor, and let the pastor ask for this certain thing. Say, now, tonight, our brother Jones, he had a, a horrible accident. His house burned down. And tonight, as Christians, we're going together to each one of us make a pledge of what we can do to help Brother Jones back with his house again, see, or, or whatever it is. See, we, we do that. Let that be said from the platform. That's the way to do that. And then let the pledges be given, and then give it over to the uh, treasurer of the church, and these pledges be paid through the treasurer of the church and give to them and, and give the person a receipt for it, because I don't know whether that's tax redemption or not. I guess it is for something like that. Now, but when it comes to like a, a stranger come in, a stranger come in, like he's a man comes in and said, well, you know what, I, um, I, I'm on a journey and uh, I blowed out a tire and I want a new tire. Take me up offering tonight for a new tire. Now that shouldn't be done. No, that should not be done. And if it seems to, if it seems to be a worthy thing of somebody that you know, the board could meet and designate a certain amount of money from the treasurer to buy that man a tar or whatever it was, or either if the church treasury is low and it's decided by the board uh, that these, the pastor shouldn't have nothing to do in this. The, the deacons are supposed to do this, see, or the boards. And now, if, this, um, if it's agreed then to give to the pastor, the pastor can take the offering. But notice, if it's a stranger, it's in an emergency, a fellow needs a little money, and you feel that it's for a just cause. Now, this is my opinion. If it's for a real just cause, and you know it is for a just cause. Now, first, if you go up there and look on my books at the house, of uh, people coming by and say, I'm Reverend so-and-so from a certain, certain church, and I, I had some trouble down the road here, and I, I need a set of tires, and know it, I just come in from a meeting and had an offering or something like that. I'd give it to them, really to go get a set of tires and look in the minutes. There never was such a minister as that never lived in such a place. And there's ten or $20,000 on the books from these years that I give out like that. Never know nothing about them, where they was. Come to find out other ministers say, well, he made me for so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Now, the church is not responsible only for their own. That's right. Their own, they're responsible. But if there seems to be a worthy cause, and then <coughs> if, you, the, if you trustees might say, well, now, wait a minute. This man... There is his car down there. This is to happen. And this, it's not of our congregation, see? But it is. Then, if they want to do it like that and would say something special about an outsider, not our own now. See? Not our own people. Our own people be taken up right here amongst their, their own, their brothers here, see? But if it's somebody on the outside and a fellow says he's hungry or, and somebody wants to reach down his pocket and give him some charity, that's up to you. But I'm talking about from the church. And then, if the church people are asked to donate then now if you got an evangelist of course in here preaching then you take you that's understood before he comes you know that you'll give him offering or pay him salary or whatever he wants to do but then if this person is here and it's for a just cause and the pastor and the board would want to agree and tell the pastor upon it then let the pastor say a certain certain person is sitting here we don't know the man he come in and he asked us for he says his children are hungry we haven't got the time we haven't had the time to investigate the, the 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 claim, see, if there's anything like that, then our our if there's anything among our own, our our own deacons go investigate those claims, see. And then if it's worthy, then do it. If it isn't worthy, don't do it. You don't have to. But now, if it's a man here, you you let the pastor say. Now the trustee board told me they did not know this person, 
But the man is sitting here. He says his name is Jim Jones or whatever it might be. And he's sitting right here. Would you stand up, Mr. Jones? Now, Mr. Jones, at the end of the service, you stand just at the back door there as you go out. And if any people feel in your heart or anything that you want to do for this man, give it to him as you go out. Is that understood now? Did you get that on yours? Uh, to those who are on the tape, and uh, one of the uh, brother Collins missed it on his tape. I want to uh, reinstate that uh, quotation again, if because uh, he's one of the deacons. If uh, if there be any other uh, uh, one man comes in that you and is in emergency and he wants an offering from the church, let the trustees or deacons meet together and uh, let the uh, meet together and make this decision. Then tell the pastor. It might be done like this. Let them, let the pastor say that this certain man, call him by name, we know him not. And our policy here is to in, investigate before we take offerings for people, and that is of our own. But this man here, he says he's broke down, he's had an emergency, he's got sick children, he's trying to get medicine for his children, or whatever it might be, the emergency. Now, he's standing right here. Would you stand up, sir? See, and let him stand up and say, Now, you people see what, who he is. Now, at the close of this service, this man shall stand there at the front door. And people going out that feel that you want to contribute to this, you're at liberty. We only announced it in the church. You're not sanctioning it. You're only announcing it. See, that's hospitality to a stranger. See, you understand now? All right. I think that settles that question. What about the tapes? Now, as what about the tapes? It's got a question mark. As many are writing the office and blaming you for the action on the tapes. Also, about others around the church selling tapes. If Mr. McGuire has to pay royalties on them. All right. The tapes is by contract. And if I, I don't know just exactly when a contract is expired. But the trustees, this belongs to the trustees, not the deacons. The trustees, not the pastor. Trustees. The trustees, ever so often, they, they write a contract, as I understand it, and if this, this is wrong, then the trustees correct. Uh, these trustees has an agreement with the person who is making the tapes and the tapes are by franchise. No one else can make tapes unless it be permitted by the person that has the franchise. And they cannot be sold unless permitted by the person that has the franchise because that's the law. See, that the franchise holds it. See, and if the fr one who holds a franchise wants to let so-and-so make tapes, that's up to him. If he wants to let everybody make tapes, that's up to him. If he wants everybody to sell tapes, that's up to the person who holds a franchise. He should have a, a little written note signed from the holder of the franchise to make and sell tapes. Because then he's clearing the law. Because if you don't, the man has a franchise on it. You'd be in, liable on yourself to, if it be a, a, a foul person that wanted to cause some trouble, he could really do it. You go over that franchise because that's just like a copyright. See, the same thing, you're not allowed to do it. It's a great fine to do that. So if the people are making tapes, perhaps they have an agreement from Mr. McGuire who who has who, who draws royalties on the tapes. And now, and uh, I don't know about that because I'm not here enough with you to know who these things are and who it would be referring to. I suppose that Mr. McGuire still has it because out there I, in California or Arizona where I'm at, I understand they're still buying tapes from the California. Uh, brother Sothman, the father-in-law of Mr. McGuire, which is our brother here in the church, uh, I think that Mr. McGuire still has it, uh, the, the franchise on it. Now, there has been complaints all along on the making of the tapes. Now, when there is a complaint on anything pertaining to the finances of this church, it's duty-bound to the trustees to see that thing is cleared. Okay? There should not by any means be anything. Now, you see here it says on this card here, 
that uh, uh, they're writing to the office and blaming you. Frankly, I've had many letters on it and want to know why they can't get their tapes. Now, you know your contract with the one who has the franchise. As I understood, the tapes, I, I want nothing to do with them. Myself. If anybody can use the tape for furthering the gospel, amen. But first, Brother Roberson and them started to make them. Brother Beeler and several of them started to make them. And then the two boys, uh, Brother Mercer and Brother Gold, made them for years. And of course, when each one of the men has made them, there has been complaints on every one. But it's seemingly here lately, there has been a great complaint about not getting their tapes. People has called me up from across the country and then another being retract tapes. It'll be playing one thing one minute and play back on another another thing and then you can't even understand what they are. Now, these people paying for these tapes should get a genuine tape. I don't care what they have to do to get it. We want to see our customers and our brothers, which they are our customers and our brothers and so forth, they must have a A number one tape. Now, you trustees see to that, that these people are satisfied. If not satisfied, their money must be returned to them immediately. And someone's called me and said they've been waiting for months for tapes. Now, I don't know how Brother McGuire tends to this. I, I don't know about that. It's, I know nothing about it. And I, it's none of my business to know nothing about That's his business with them and the trustees. Now, I'm not trying to step in, but I'm just telling you what the law of it is. See? The law of it is that these tapes, from the time that they send for them, them tapes are supposed to be on their road within a day or three or four or five days. After they send for them tapes, it's got to be in the mail. Or the franchise could be canceled at any time when these orders are disobeyed. See? Now, and every six months or a year, this is supposed to be renewed. This agreement is supposed to be renewed. You're supposed to meet on this certain date that this franchise says that you got to meet. And then it's supposed to be that other people are supposed to come in at that time and you're supposed to notify others who have been asking about the tapes and come in with their agreement and sit down and talk it over. Now, these orders must be carried out, see? And it must be carried right because it is complaining. It complained with Leo and Gene. It complained with everyone. It's complained with Brother McGuire. And it'll be complained with somebody else. But let's find out what the complaining is. Now, but when the tapes are beginning to pile up, boxes of them, letters by the dozens pouring in, and they, see, it doesn't fall back to the tape maker. It falls on me. They're always bawling me out about it. Now, it's my duty as a Christian to see that the people get what they pay for. And I want you trustees to see if they get it. If they have to charge more, get a better tape, get a better machine. We want somebody to make that tape who makes it right. That's our interest. The tape must be made right. And the customer must be satisfied or stop the whole tape thing altogether. We won't have no tapes. Just let anybody make them that wants to. But if they're going to charge for them, let them see that they get what they paid for because that's Christianity. That's the more they do. And when they come here to listen to the gospel, I want to give them the best that I know how to give them. See? And when they come here, I want to see that everybody and everything's carried on. That's the reason I'm telling you deacons, trustees, and pastors here tonight that you must carry this out to the letter because the people are coming here to find God. And we got to have these things in order. And also the tapes must be put into the place. If they have to charge more, if you got second class tapes are running, then get better tapes. If they have to charge more for them, charge more for them. Let the person get what they charge for. I'm not interested in one bit of royalty, not one penny, and neither is the tabernacle interested. I don't want you to be. Don't be interested in that. In, in royalties, if they pay some, I guess you'd have to take a little royalty on account of it being made here. I think that's something that he said to Mr. Miller and him about the law. We had to take certain royalties or so forth. That's up to you all to see to that. I'm not have nothing to do with what that's set together. You all take care of that. I can't take care of all of it. I'm just telling you the way it should be and must be run. That uh, you understood, I said must be run. So uh, we want uh, this run out right. And if you have to have a better machine to take it, then get a better machine. If it has to be... Now, I said to them, I said, every mission that I go into the field, 
before I go, I'll notify you what sermons I'm going to preach on out there. Something that I've already, I promised you all, which I'm going to retake back again Sunday night, that before I preach any new message, it would come from this tabernacle first because it seemed to get a better recording. You remember that? Then what I'll come here and preach my messages, then go back out and notify the tape man what services. They ask me what one, what you go preach. I was on this night and go so and so and this night and so and so. So they can have it made up and ready for the customer to get it right there. Got it right with them. A better tape than to have out in the media because it's made right here at the tabernacle where the acoustics are good. See? Now, now, going into this great evangelistic, what I'm going to do now in overseas and things, I can't promise that. You see, I can't promise that I'll preach my first message here because when you preach around the messages, you've got to have something that it gets stale to you. It's bound to get stale to the ones that's listening at it. You've got to do something different, you see, and bring just as the message is there. But let them put a machine in the field or whatever it is that'll take these tapes perfectly and make a perfect tape and each tape play back and check before it goes or just stop the whole thing. Don't even have to do Let every man make his own tape. See? But get it done right. See? So this complaint will stop. We don't want no complaints at all. If there is a complaint, let's take care of it. And we have it over with. Now, I'll hurry as quick as I can. But i got about two more questions here, three. And then we'll be finished. How far, Brother Branham, can or should a deacon go to keep order in the church? Should... We keep the order or wait until Brother Neville tells us what we should do. That isn't Brother Neville's job. That's your job. See? You don't tell Brother Neville what to preach on, how to preach it. See, that's your job. You deacons. You're supposed to do that. You take care of that. That's nothing to Brother Neville. That's your job. See? Now, uh, if a policeman's out here on the street and he sees a man stealing uh, property out of the back of a car, should he call the mayor and say, Now, Mayor, Your Honor, sir, I am uh, working for you here on this police force. Now, I find a man up the street here. He's, um, uh, he was stealing some tires off of a car last night. Now, I just wonder what's your opinion of that. <laughs> See, that wouldn't be sensible, would it? No, sir. If he's doing something wrong, arrest him. And if a man's doing something wrong here in a church or anybody, stop him. Talk to him. Don't be irritant. But if they won't listen, speak in a way that they know what you're saying. See, see, like you tell a child, say, walk back there and he's misbehaving. Deacon, stay at your place. But there's four of you. Stay two in the front and two in the back on these corners or somewhere like that and watch real close for renegades and everything else come in like this. You see, and you be on the guard. You get your post of duty and stay there. That's your seat. Or stand right beside the wall and watch everybody come in. A deacon takes care of the house of God. Someone come in, speak to him, be there to greet them. Shake their hand. That you're the policeman. Uh, could we show you the cloakroom? Or would you be seated? Could we hand you a songbook or something? Or now we would like for you to enjoy yourself here and, and pray. And, and we are happy you're here with us tonight. Lead them right down to the place and say, Would you like to be closer? Would you like to be back here? Or wherever more. That's hospitality. A policeman or the deacon is a military police to the army. Courtesy but yet with authority. See, if you know what a military police is, is actually, if he carries out his rights, I think he's just like a chaplain, you see. It's courtesy and everything, but yet he has an authority. See, he must mind him, see. He puts these rookies get out there and get drunk while he puts them in their place. And so is the deacon to put them in a place. Now remember, the deacon is a policeman, and a deacon's office is actually more strict than most any office in the church. I don't know of an office any more stricter than a deacon's office. That's right, because he's got a he's got a real job, and he's God's man. He's God's man just as much as a pastor is God's man. Certainly, he is. He's God's servant. Now, the trustees, only thing they're under duty by God to watch that finances and take care of that the things that goes on, like I told you about them tapes and and about the other things here goes on about the building and repairs and keeping <coughs> up the finances and things. That's that's what they're a trustee of the property finances and things. The deacons have nothing to do in that. And neither does the, the trustee have anything to do with the deacon's office. Now, if the deacons wants to ask the trustees help on anything, or the, or the trustees, the deacons, and you're all working together, but that's your duties. It's singling out. All right? Now, no, don't ask Brother Neville. If Brother Neville asks you to do something, then that's, that's your pastor with courtesy and love and everything. He'd say, uh, 
Brother Collins, Brother Hickerson, Brother Tony or somebody, um, would you see what's wrong back there in the corner? At the post of duty like that, you know, as a real man of God. Remember, you are not working for Branham Tabernacle. Neither are you working for Brother Neville or me. You're working for Jesus Christ. See, you're, that's who you're... And he's, he's respecting your loyalty just the same as he is to that pastor or to anybody else. He's expecting your loyalty. And we want to show our loyalty. Now, sometimes it gets hard. It's hard for me to see a minister sitting there I love with all my heart. You just have to really tell him. See? But in a way of love, I've got a hand out to help him. But see? And they come to me and say, Brother Branham, you're just a wonderful person. Why can't you just compromise a little on that baptism and on this, that, and the other? That's secured in this and seat. I say, Brother, I love you. But now let's just take, let's take the Scripture and see who's right or wrong. See? I've got to be able to say, Oh, now, Brother Bram, I tell you, you're all wrong. See, goes flying up. Well, I say, Well, perhaps I am. Then if I am, surely you tell me you're, you know where I'm wrong at, then you show me where I'm wrong. And I'm willing to take, see, same thing. Hey, you ain't got no business telling that child to sit down. Now, the deacon is, a, is the custodian at the house of God. See, now, if you, he takes care of the house of God and keeps it in order. That's what the scripture says. If you've got anything else that a deacon should do, you come tell me. See, that's the same thing, but that, that's your duty to do that. Yeah, just back up and you should ask nobody. That's, that's just your duty. Brother Neville don't ask nobody. The church don't have to ask. I mean, if, uh, the trustees don't have to go ask Brother Neville if, if he wants the roof put on the tabernacle. See, no, no, that's not uh, nothing to Brother Neville. Not nothing to me. That's to you. The deacons don't have to ask. The same way to the pastor. Why do you go to preach on? I don't want you to do this. They ain't got no business saying that. He's under God. See, the pastor. And then if um, if if Brother Neville he preaches a message that the Lord has given us, and we're all together in this. And if I tell Brother Neville something wrong, God holds me responsible for it. That's right. See? So God is the boss of all of it. See, and we're just working as His ambassadors. You see, down here in these offices. Please, next question, and then I think we got one more, and then we, we'll stop. Please explain just how the gifts of tongues are to operate in our church. I have did that. When can the church be put in order as are just where the gifts are to operate? We've just explained that. Just how many C-H-R-I-S-T-M-A um, could you see what they did? Instruments. Oh, instruments. Um, how many instruments are we to uh, have in church besides organ and piano? Well, it depends on if you had a string band or whatever you had. See, I don't know what you got. What this means, I don't understand it. But the organ and the piano are property of the church. Now, if the uh, song leader would take a notion to have a, a trumpets and cornets and so forth like that, and somebody's coming to church and they play these instruments and they're in a band, and, and then, of course, then that's for your trustees to take it up with the trustees and see if they got money to buy their instruments and so forth or whatever like that. I guess that's what the question is. But if they have their own instruments, wonderful. <coughs> if they don't have their own instruments and they're a member here of a band, not just a person who runs in here and plays once in a while and runs out like that. It's got to be a band in the church. The church wouldn't buy a, a trumpet for a man that plays it here and tomorrow night somewhere else and somewhere else and drop in once in a while and play a little bit. No, sir, it's got to be a band right here, organized band with the, the leader. Then the church talked to them about buying the instruments. Please explain just how we are to... Uh, how we deacons can keep the people uh, just uh, in the sanctuary before or after. Please explain. Keep the people quiet in the oh. sanctuary before and after church. All right. I would suggest this, brethren. Now, there's a great thing. Wish we had more time to put on it. Or it's, it's, it, it means something to us. See. Now, the church is not a 
if it wants to, if you want to run this tape down some night and play it before the meetings that the people understand it, let this be played. This this part of the tape of no more. Just this. Any part of this that you want to play for a certain thing, just keep running it till you find it and then play it. See? Because it's questions. Now, deacons of the church and as, a, as I said, are the police of the church. But the church is not a general meeting house for, for fellowship and friendship and frolic. The church is a sanctuary of God. We come here. Now, if we want to meet one another, let me come to your house. You come to my house. You go to one another's house and meet one another. But just to frolic around through the church and talking and things like that, it's not right, brethren. We come here, we get the whole thing off of our mind. If we would come here, look where we used to do it years ago. Sister Gertie was a pianist. When I pastored here, I, w I had to be pastor, deacon, trustee, and everything else at once, see? But I, I had to do it. Now you don't have to do it that way, see? Because you've got man to carry this out. But when the, I had ushers, Brother Seward and all of them at the door. They had books piled around there at the door, sitting in a chair or something there. And when someone come in, you show them a place to hang your coat or help them to their seat, give them a songbook, and ask them to be in prayer. And then everybody sat in their seat and silently prayed until starting time. See? And then at starting time, Sister Gertie, the pianist, got up there and started the music before when the people were coming together. I would suggest to have your organist to get up there with some real nice music. If she can't be here, put it on tape and then play it or something. And have music, real sweet, sacred music going on. So And ask people. And if people <coughs> goes to uh, uh, talking and carrying on like that, let one of the deacons get up at the microphone up there at the desk and say, shh, shh, shh. Like that. Say, at the tabernacle here. We, we want you to come to worship. Let's not make noise now. Listen to the music. Get your seat. Sit down. Be reverent. See? Pray or read the Bible. This in the sanctuary here is where the Lord dwells. And we want everybody to be real reverent and worship. Not to be running around talking before the services. Congregate yourselves. And you come here to talk to the Lord. See? Either be in silent prayer, see, or read your Bible. When I went into the Marvel Church up there at the Norman Vincent Peale, you've heard of him, you see. And I went into the great psychologist teacher, you know. And uh, I went into his church. I just thought, I wish my tabernacle would do that again. Them deacons stand right there at the door just as soon as you come in. They, of course, they hand you a Sunday school slip. Taking you right down, he had to empty it three times. You only hold about four or five hundred, you know, and New York's a big place, and he's a popular man. I think they had to have one class at 10 o'clock and one at 11. Same sermon right over again. Same service exactly. Same sheet of paper. But when they dismissed, and they had, I believe, five minutes for the church to be exactly, nobody else could come in until they got out, and the deacons opened the way, and the church filled up. They had these old box seats, you know, they go in like that and sit down in the pews where you open the door, old-fashioned. It's been standing there for around 200 years, I guess, the old marble church had. And you could have heard a pin drop anywhere in that church and everybody in prayer for at least 30 minutes before the first note was ever hit on the organ, the prelude. And uh, just everybody in prayer. I thought, how wonderful it is. Now when I minister that prelude, but I think they played one prelude for about three to five minutes. Uh, how great thou art, or something like that, or like that. And then when they did, everybody stopped praying and listened to the prelude. See, it give a change from prayer to the prelude. And then when they uh, played that, then the choir leader directed the choir. And then they had a congregational song and the choir. And then they were ready for their Sunday school class. See, and then, um, and then when it was over, there was nothing went on except divine worship all the time. And that's what we come there for. And I think it would be a good thing. If our church, and I'm just saying this, we would do it. See? Let's do it. If somebody does anything, it's ain't, I think it would be a good thing. If it's a good thing, then let's do it. See? We don't want to put off any good thing. We'll do it anyhow. 
See? And just go ahead and, and stand up there. And, and if they start on a morning or something like that, people visiting, just let some of one, one of the deacons or somebody walk up there and say, uh, it's been made a rule in the tabernacle here. I don't know what they do. If they may, may, I never hear. You see, I don't know. I've never heard before services. And when they come in and they start talking, let somebody get up there and they, shh, 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 just a moment. See? Let, let, give the sister, get her up there and get her playing that music. If you don't, put it on tape and get it out there, see? Of the organ music. And say, now, we are, there's a new rule in the tabernacle. When people enter here, we're not to whisper, talk, but to worship. See? Now, just a few minutes, the service will be starting. Until then, just either read your Bible or bow your head and silently pray. And a few times like that, they'll all learn. See, see you hear somebody talking. And then if it gets down for a, after a few times like that, after a while you hit a place where somebody say, see somebody talking, nobody else talking, see? Well, then one of the deacons walk up and say, we uh, we want you to worship during the time of the service, you see. Yeah. See, it's not a house of talk. It's a house of worship. Yeah. Understand? I think that was it. Please explain. Yeah, let's see. Uh, it's please explain how to the deacon should in the sanctuary. Yeah, that's all. That's right. That's it. All right. Now here's the last one, Brother Brandon. When we have uh, had opportunities on the beginning of the service, I'm, I'm no, com no. We've had complaints. It's wrote real little. And I had complaints in it. Mm -hmm. Had complaints, and the beginning of the service, we have. Uh, it's, We, we, we have songs. We have songs, testimonies, testimonies and prayer. prayers, and prayer. prayer requests, special singing, and um, you may, maybe get it. Get into the message. Get into the message at Maybe. eleven or to after. or after, but don't have too much. Don't have too much time for the word. Some of the people get restless and have. Uh, leave. leave before it it is it's before before it's over it's please explain how many, many uh, songs and what time to start the message and some some time we have pr prayer request and it in, ends up in a testimony meeting some uh, Things uh, that don't be don't, right. don't seem right at the time. I hope I've got that Billy trying to help me here. If on the tape you have somebody in the me meeting in the service listening to what this was, is Billy trying to help me read it because it's wrote very very fine and uh, I couldn't make it out. I got the general <laughs> idea. It is that how many songs uh, should we sing before starting the service? And what time should service start? Now, the first thing I want to make here is a confession. And when I'm wrong, I won't admit I'm wrong. See? And I and I, I make a confession here that I'm kind of the leader of that. Because it's been me holding these long services and things. It's what got the church into this routine, see, of doing so. But it shouldn't be. And now, remember, I have... I am telling you all Sunday night, if the Lord willing, on Sunday night, and I'm trying to allot my services from henceforth, if I have to stay a week extra, to about 30 or 40 minutes at the longest for my services. Because I found this, that a service that's it stands up and the message is given and the power, if you go too far, you wear the people out and they don't get it. The reason I've been given, I know that all along. See, the most successful speakers are those who have exactly... Jesus is a man of few words. Watch his sermons. Watch Paul's sermons on the day of Pentecost. Probably taking 15 minutes and he punched a, there something that, that, that uh, sent 3,000 souls into the kingdom of God. See, just right straight to the spot, see. And I, I'm guilty because the reason I've done this, not because I didn't know different, but I'm making tapes. See? And these tapes will be played in houses for hours after hours after hours. But as you'll find out the coming Sunday, the reason I've done it this coming Sunday, the reason I've done these things, I might say it right now on the tape, the reason that I have did this is because of this tremendous weight upon me for the message of this hour to get it out. Now the message is out. Now, 
I'm taking a 30 minutes or something like that after the first of the year in my meetings out in the everywhere I go and try to even set my watch to a 30 minute or not over 40 at the most punch to that message and make the altar call if I or whatever I'm going to do or call the prayer line and not take that much time because you do wear the people out. I know that. But look here. I guess in the year we haven't had a dozen people to get up and walk out and sometimes I keep them here for two and three hours. See? That's right. Because it's been making these tapes that goes all over the world. See? And the people out there, they'll sit for hours and listen to that. Ministers. And so for Germany, Switzerland, Africa, Asia, and everywhere. See? Listening to that. But see, for the sanctuary, for the church, and that's all right. If you're here making a tape and you got a two-hour tape, put a two-hour message on it. But if you're not making a tape for something like that, then cut our message. See, cut our message down. I'll tell you why. There's some fill up easy, some fill up long, see, like that. And you've got to be a, the happy medium between it. And now many times that we ruin our services by a dragged out testimony meeting, which I know I'm guilty of doing it. And you get out when you used to have street meetings and let some old brother stand out there and he'll stand out and ask him to offer a word of prayer and he'll pray for the mayor of the city and for the governor of the state and for the president of the union and, and uh, everybody like that and all the pastors around and you know, each one by number and Sister Jones that's in the hospital and things like that. And the people standing walking by on the street meeting just keep, just keep on walking, see? He just wore them out. We're just a see the main thing now. Your prayer is to be in secret. Your main <laughs> long prayer. Pray all. Enter into a secret closet. Close the door. That's where you want to pray all day, all night, or two hours. Pray there. But in here, where you've got the attention of the people, make your prayer short, quick. Add it. Make all your service and put the most of your service time into that word. That's the main thing. Punch that word just as hard as you can. See? Get the word to the people. Now, here's my suggestion. Now, now, remember, I've confessed that I'm guilty of leading this on. But then I've told you why I've led it on. I'm making two-hour tapes to be sent overseas and everywhere of a message, you see. But the church shouldn't pattern that, the message here at the tabernacle, after them tapes two hours to be gone places, see, and go out like that. Now, Here's what your order... Let me just give you an example. Would that be all right? A suggestion. I would say that the church should have its doors open at a certain time. Let the congregation come in, let the songs be playing, and let everybody come in to worship, not to visit. And don't let them visit afterwards. Tell them to dismiss and get out, not to visit. If you wanted to visit, there's a hole outside. But this is a sanctuary. Let this be kept clean. Now, if the Spirit of the Lord is dealing here, let's keep it Spirit of the Lord. And and, uh, and it'll keep moving. If you don't, you just mark my words. It's going to fall. It sure will. And let's keep it. It's our duty. That's why I'm here tonight. Let's keep this thing lined up with these, with these orders. Now look, I would say this. Ordinarily, unless we are giving out especially and tell them you're going to tape a message. See? Now, Brother Neville has a message here that he's going to, he's got a message he wants to get out to the people out on tape or something. Say, now next Sunday night, we're going to tape a two-hour tape, three-hour tape, or what or what more. We're going to give a two- or three-hour tape, or whatever it might be, next Sunday night. And uh, then the people know. And then when they come in, say, now, we are going to tape a message tonight. And I've got a message here that I want to tape and send out. I've been, uh, I feel led to send this message out. It's going to be taped. It may be two hours, three hours, or whatever it is. Say that. But ordinarily, just as I do when I'm going into a place like one of them businessmen's meetings or I'm out in my meetings out there for a prayer line, if I stood up there and give a three-hour message of a night before having a healing service, you see where it puts me? See? Why the people next night, your congregation's half of what it was. See? Because they just can't do it. They've got to go to work and everything. I'd suggest this. <coughs> that ordinarily, I watched Brother Neville last night uh, when he preached. I know we all know that's a startling message. I took notes of it out here in my pocket to use it in other messages of my own. <laughs> that's right. Uh, the way of escape, see. And that was a marvelous message. You see how quick he got that through? See? About 35 minutes. See? And he, he had it over. See? Now that was fine. Now, and Brother Neville, usually his messages are like that. 
See, it's not that long. See, but where you kill your meeting is all that drawn out stuff before you get to it. See, now, and um, and uh, where you do that, now, I know. And I, look, I, I'm not saying that dishonorably to you, trustees or deacons or or pastor, but I'm just telling you. See what's truth, and this is what it must be. Now, you, what does it? Now, everybody, you're all good natured. Every one of you, man, are good natured. One, so I'd say all, but brother so and so, he's not got a good nature. We're all praying for him. But you, you do have good natures, and you're long suffering, gentle, quite sober man. That's fine. But don't be a sissy with that. Jesus is a good nature too, but when it comes time to say things, it's written, My Father's house has made a house of prayer, and you are making it a den of thieves. See? See he, he knows when to speak and when not to. That's, that's, that's what we got to do. See, there never was a person like Jesus. He was God. And remember, He even talked about being a deacon in the church. He, he took over. He planted some ropes together, and He didn't wait to gently walk them out. He beat them out. See? As a house of God. And he was playing the part of a deacon for an example to you deacons. See? He was your example. And now it's, it's written, My Father's house has made a house of prayer. Now remember, Jesus was a deacon then. You know that. Jesus is taking the part of a deacon. When he comes to the part of a pastor, what do he say? You blind Pharisees. <laughs> leaders of the blind. See? He was taking the part of a pastor then. And when he told them what was going to happen, he took the part of a prophet. See? And when they required that there must be tribute paid, he taken the part of a trustee. Peter, go down and cast a hook into the river and the first fish you take up has got a coin in his mouth. Pay him. See? Pay your just debts. If it's, Give Caesar what Caesar. God's what's God. He was both pastor, prophet, trustee, and deacon. Sure was. So then you see what he did. Let that be your example in the house here at this Brandon Tabernacle that we want to be a house that he'll be honored in with everything, every office, every place, that there be no taking back, there be gentleness and sweetness and kindness, but yet straight on the line. Every man's that he's supposed to do to you. See, that's the, way, that's the way he wants it. He never slagged. When it come time to say, call what was what, he called it. When it come time to show gentleness in, he showed gentleness. He was sweet, kind, understanding, but stern. And everything was right to the dot with him. And he did that for your example. Now, the Holy Spirit just gave me that. So I never thought about that, him being deacon before, but he was. See, he, he acted as deacon. Now, I'd say this. Say if your services begin at 7.30, if that's the time, open your church half hour beforehand to 7 o'clock. Let the pianist tell the organist, do you pay her? You all pay the organist? Does she pay her pianist? She does it free will? Ask her with gentleness, even if she wants to have pay for it, to give her something for it. Tell her we want her a half hour for service. And if she says, well, I can't do it or something complaint, then just have her come here and make a tape of some sweet organ music, you see. And let put that on the... It don't have to be here every time. Set your tape up. See? Let one of the deacons, trustee, or have you open the janitor, put it on up there, the tape on, and let it be playing while the people comes. See? Because if the deacons are not here or somebody, let trustee or somebody be able to do it. Then let them play for a half hour. But at exactly 7.30, let that bell toll. On top of the building. See? You still have your bell out there? Yeah, all right. That's your bell toll at 7.30. And that means that we're not going to walk up and down the church and shake hands with Joneses and all that. Let the song leader be on the job. If there's no song leader there, let the deacon see that there are the see that there's somebody to start leading songs when that bell starts tolling. Turn to your hymn book. Number so and so. See? Let it be right on the dot. It's at 7.30. All right? Then I have a congregational song. And then maybe a second congregational song. And then have somebody already spoke of, if you can, to lead in prayer. Right, let the, uh, the pastor, ever, well, the pastor shouldn't be there. The, the song leader should do that. If it's Brother Caps, I think. See, he didn't know what to do. Let, let him have someone spoke, or either lead in prayer himself. Have the congregation stand in prayer. See? Just stand up. And let somebody lead in prayer. Now, if you don't watch... Now, we believe that everybody should come to the house of God and pray. That's a, that's a place of prayer. But when you're in that sanctuary, conserve your time. See? You call them all up around the altar, you'll find out there'll be somebody will be there for 15, 20 minutes. Your time's all run out. Let's, you're, see, your praying's at home. 
Jesus said, when you pray, don't stand like the hypocrites do and, and for a long, uh, uh, make a long prayer and say this, that, or the other and, and uh, all like that for a showing. See? He said, when you pray, pray, enter into the closet, secret closet, close the door behind you. Pray to your Father that seeth in secret. He shall reward thee opening. Now that's the way to have secret prayer. That's what he said do. But when you, somebody, when they come in, let the song leader say, uh, all right, after the first song, then uh, let somebody have prayer. Uh, whoever who it is, just a short prayer. Don't stand up and pray for all the governors and so forth like that. If there's any prayer request, let it be known. Let it be sent in. Have them sent in. Write it. Say here, we're tonight in having prayer. We're remembering sister so and so, brother so and so in the hospital, so and so and so and so and so and so. Remember him in your prayers as you pray. Brother Jones, will you lead us in prayer? Let's stand. See? Let it be laid on the platform. Tell them, let them get used to that. If you got a request for prayer, lay it up here. Up here, don't be. Who has a request now? Would you be let it known? But and then the first thing somebody gets, say glory to God. You want to start off like that, and the first thing you know, it's a half hour before they sit down. Sometimes, see, we are responsible for this church, not others. This is our responsibility to God. These offices are your responsibility to God. See, reason I'm saying you're not telling you all this is because it's my responsibility to God. It's your responsibility to carry it out. See, now and when something. Uh, like that, let somebody lead in prayer, and when they do, that's fine. Let them lead in prayer, then sit down. And if you got a special, I wouldn't say this. I wouldn't go along. And if anybody wants to sing a special, announce it in the church. Tell them that any specials or anything that wants to be sang, let them see the song leader before the church ever starts. And have it say, "Well, I'm sorry, brother. I sure like to do it, but I've got my special for tonight." Maybe if you tell me you go be here on a certain night, I'll put it on a program for you. See, I got my program wrote out here. Let let Brother Katz or ever who's leading songs and have a song leader, no matter who it is. And don't let them stand up and say, I'll carry on like they're a preacher. See, let them stand up there and lead songs. That's their business. It's the pastor's been to preach. See, not lead songs. He ain't the lead songs. The song leader leads songs. He's responsible and should come out freshly under the anointing of the Holy Ghost from the office in there somewhere. When it comes time, he don't even have to be on the platform this is going on. Let him stay in the office back there. See? Or back in here, or wherever it is. The intercom chair will bring it in. See? When it's time. When he hears that last, if there is a special, like a solo duet or something, for your third song, see? That you've had two congregational songs, prayer, your offering, if you're going to take it, and uh, let every man be at his post of duty. So, all right, while we're singing this last song, now if the ushers will, <laughs> let them come forward for the evening offering. See, and while they finish singing that song, here's the usher standing here. Say, all right, now we're going to have prayer and then offering prayer. We uh, want to remember so and so here and so and so. Read that off. You know, like that, like that. All right, everyone stand. Brother, will you lead us in prayer? Then it's all over. Then while they're singing this uh, second song or whatever you're singing, you're t take your offering. If you're going to take your offering, leave it. I'll take your first song and then have your evening offering and then go on with your second song and then on through it. Then let your last song here, let your last song, see, be the pastor's call. And as soon as that last hymn is sang, let the organ start with your, your, your prelude. Your pastor walks out. See, everything's in order. Everybody's quiet. There's nothing else to be said. Every deacon at his post of duty. The pastor stand there. Come out. Greet his audience. Turn to his book and say, Tonight we're reading from the Bible. See, after he makes it up, we're reading from the Bible. And it is a good thing sometimes. You say, in respect of the Word of God, let's stand to our feet while we read the Word. Okay. Then read, Tonight I'm reading from the book of Psalms or whatever it is. Or either let somebody else read it, the song leader or associate, somebody there with you. Let him read it, whatever. It would be best if you read it yourself if you can. Then read it like it. Then take your text. See, in that much time, you spend about 30 minutes. It's right then about 8 o'clock. And from 8 to about quarter till 9, somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes, lay that word in there just as the Holy Ghost gives it to you. See, just like that. Just place it right in there where he says do it. See, under the anointing. Then take your altar call. Say, if anyone here in this church that would like to accept Christ as Savior, we're asking, inviting you to the altar right now. To stand to your feet, see. And if uh, 
And if no one stands, say, is there anyone here that's a candidate for baptism, that's already uh, have repented and wants to be baptized in water for the remission of sins? If they wish to come, we're giving you the opportunity now. Will you come while the organ's still playing? See, nobody comes. Say then, is there anybody here that would uh, that uh, has never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and would want to do so tonight? We want us to pray for you. Well, maybe somebody comes up. Then let two or three lay hands on them, pray for them, send them right back in one of them rooms. Somebody in there with them, instruct them somewhere how to come through with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The congregation's all away from them. If anybody comes to be, wants to accept Christ and stand there at the altar to be prayed for, make your, make, let them pray. And when they do, just say, bow your heads now. We're going to pray. And say, do you believe if any little thing that would delay the congregation in any way at all, send them right into the prayer room and go in there with them or send somebody in there with them and let the congregation go right on. See, like that, you haven't held them nowhere then. See, and then while before... And, a, and, a few, and then if they say if nobody comes and say would there be somebody that would like to be anointed with oil tonight for the sickness we pray for the sick here well I'd like to see you uh, uh, privately brother Neville well you see me in the office see one of the deacons they'll take it up see and uh, I've got something I'd like to say to you but well uh, one of the deacons here will see you to the office and we'll I'll see you immediately after the service now as uh, we'll stand now for dismissing see and you haven't been over about an hour and 45 minutes in the whole thing see See, hour and 30 minutes, your service is over. You've had the little quick punch. You you give it what's done. You've done the, and everybody's satisfied and go home feeling good. See, if you don't, then you see, if you let, see, you, you you mean well. See, but see, you know, this is about 33 years in this platform for me. 33 years in the world around. You learn a little something in that much time, surely. See, if you don't, you better quit. <laughs> so then, uh, see, I'll find out this. Now, if you're dealing with this saints all together, man, you can just stay all night if you wanted to. But you see, you're not dealing with them exactly. You're trying to catch these out here. Here's the ones you're catching. You got to work on their field. See, and don't bring them in here and then let the word come. And then see, there's nothing can be complained. If there's anything they wants to see you about, well, fine, take them right on into the office like that. But don't hold the congregation. And then, you know, people will get up and say, Well, I tell you, let's have a good testimony meeting. See? I don't mean any critics on this. I just mean to tell you the truth. I mean to tell you the truth. See? I found testimony meetings of more... Uh, they, they do more harm sometimes than good. See? They really do. Now, if somebody would have a red-hot testimony in time of a revival, you know, you're having a revival on your a meeting, somebody got saved and just want to say a word, well, bless God, let him unload his soul. See, if, he, if, he wants to, if he wants to do that, see, just in time of revival, say, I just want to say, uh, uh, thank the Lord for what he's done for me. He saved me last week and my hearts are burning up with the glory of God. Thanks be to God. Sit down. Hey, man, that's fine. Go on. See, that's right. But when you say, now come on, who's next? Who's next? Now let's hear a word. Let's hear a word of testimony. Now, if you got a meeting set aside a certain night for that, see, you're going to tonight, next Wednesday night, instead of prayer meeting, it's going to be a testimony meeting. We want everybody to come in, and it's going to be testimony a meeting. And then when you come to to the place to give testimony, read the word, have prayer, and then say, now we have announced this is testimony night. So let people testify for that hour or forty-five minutes or thirty minutes or whatever it is, and then and then go ahead like that. See what I mean? And I think it will help your congregation. It will help everything all together if you do it that way. Now, uh, it's, I'm getting late. So, brethren, <clears throat> brethren, these are the best of my knowledge. I see what's on your heart. This is the best of my knowledge, the questions that you have asked. Now, from now on, you know, and if it's ever in your mind, come to the tape. Ask the, uh, listen to the tape. If it's for deacons, trustees, or whatever it is, let the tape be played. Let it be played to the congregation out there. If they want to hear it, all right. And that's, that is the best of my knowledge to the will of God for this tabernacle here at 8th and Penn Street. And that's the way I'm commissioning you, brothers, to carry this out under the leadership of the Holy Spirit with all kindness and love, showing uh, your grace before people that you are Christians and Christian don't mean a baby that can be pushed around anywhere. That means a man that's full of love but yet just as full of love for God as he is for the congregation. See what I mean? 
Is there a question? The tape's about to run out here and I've got somebody waiting for me over there. What time is it supposed to be there? Right now. Right now. He's coming over himself. I'll go get him. All right. All right, sir. Now, um, I know we're going out now. If there's no no further, <coughs> any word? Uh, now, if Colin, not, brother let's Colin. dismiss... Ju- yes, Brother Collins. Uh, might be better if the tapes were turned off. All right. Well, brother... I appreciated being here with you tonight, and Brother Neville, and to uh, the deacons and trustees and Sunday school superintendent, all of you. Uh, we trust that the Lord will help you now to carry out these orders for the kingdom of God. The reason I've said this is because that I think you have grown from children to adults. When you was a child, you talked like a child, and you understood as a child, but now you're a man. So let's act as adults in the house of God, behaving ourselves and honoring our offices and honoring every office, every gift that the Lord has given us. Let's put it in order and honor God with our gifts and our offices. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee tonight for this gathering together of man that's put in the office this year to carry out the work of the Lord that's being carried on here in Jeffersonville in this church. God, may Your hand be upon them. May You help them and bless them. May the congregation and the people understand and know that this is to embedder the kingdom of God, that we might become man of understanding and know the Spirit of God and know what to do. Grant it, Father. Dismiss us now with Thy blessings, and may the Holy Spirit watch over us and guide us and protect us, and may we be ever found faithful at the post of duty. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.